Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bill and Eamon's Bogus Hangout. I'm going to have uh, our guests introduce themselves. Doc? Hi, everyone. Doc Sheldon here of Intrinsic Value SEO and Search News Central. Terry? Terry Van Horn. I guess I'm retired. I'm looking for something to do, though. I'll find it eventually. <laughs> That's good to hear. And I'm Bill Slosky, author of SEO by the Sea, director of SEO research at Go Fish Digital. Uh, so, what's new in the world of SEO, guys? You hear any of the news lately? I haven't seen anything earth shattering the last few days. You? Not really. I'm. I'm looking at uh, all this discussion about EAT. And <laughs> what it is and what it isn't, huh? And, and there's a lot of uh, interior dialogue in the SEO community about whether or not EAT really is something that matters or if it's affecting websites negatively. There was That's only because they can't have point at something and say that's what it is because of that they don't think it uh, exists well i don't see it as anything new i mean uh, the term eat is is relatively new but five years ago the concept was there i'm i'm seeing people uh saying my site has been targeted by google with their uh latest update and I don't know what to do, and, and there are people saying, yeah, that's Google's uh, brand bias, and, and then people are saying, oh, let's, Jesus. Crawl, let's crawl the site and see what's wrong, and they're finding things that are wrong. Okay, yeah, Google is brand bias. They're called entities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, what, kind, what kind of guys are to saying stuff like that? That's like 1990s stuff. I mean, come on, we've progressed further than that. Uh, you say that like you think it's a certain I said we have. I said we have. I guess we don't include that. Not, not we as a community, just. <laughs> just we. <laughs> well, there's, there's a bunch of more out there that have as well, but uh, damn, it just seems like the number who are uh, devolving rather than evolving seems to be increasing daily. Well, they understand brands because, you know, that's easy to spot, right? But entity. But, but what's tough about different. identifying what is and isn't an entity, too? I mean, there's nothing magic about that, you know? Apparently, it is. <laughs> In the minds of some, at least, eh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, look, anybody who doesn't think that, Eat, trust, authority. What's the E stand for? Expertise. Expertise, yeah. If they don't think that Google are looking for those things on, an, on a website, they should seriously be looking for a new job. But yeah, but they've, they've been looking for those things for it, years. Exactly. Exactly. Only thing that has changed is the method. See, before, you could see it. You could see where the authority was coming from. You yeah. could see where the trust, while well, trust was always, you know, 50-50. Yeah. And expertise, well, that, that's, you know, should be everybody's goal on a website is to show their expertise. Uh, those are important things. Yeah, the only, and, the only real difference I'm seeing between what existed 10 years ago and what exists now in terms of EAT is the fact that Google is putting more credence in the fact that a doctor is talking about your product or an educator or a scientist, someone with established credibility is endorsing it. That is taking on additional meaning now than what it, at least what was obvious before. Shouldn't it? I would, well, yeah, yeah, it should, certainly. I just, you know, so I see that formal recognition being a little bit more prevalent now. But the basic concept of, of trying to be knowledgeable and showing your expertise and, and being reliable and trustworthy and straightforward, that's nothing new. I you mean, know why they're complaining? It's too hard. 
because they know, can't automate it. Yeah, no, yeah. Nobody's come out yet with a spinner to fix that. <laughs> yeah, and in certain products, the people that would be seen as the real experts don't write, don't talk. Lawyers would be a number one on the list. Yeah. Doctors probably, well, probably ahead of lawyers. But you get where I'm coming from. Certain people almost can't talk. Yeah. There are some lawyers who are vocal, who do speak up. There's a Canadian lawyer named Michael Geist who writes about uh, security issues and writes about uh, different legal issues. He's a really good writer and he's really authoritative. He's really an expert. He's worth reading. Yeah, I knew another Canadian lawyer, similar. I worked on a Gave him some advice on an early case uh, uh, as to how certain actions that a company were taking would affect search engines. And it was a lot about entities, mm -hmm. even before then. Then it would have been the city, but it, now it would be an entity, right? Well, you know, Steve and I had a client uh, a couple of years ago who in the medical field, who had a, a, his area of expertise focused in a particular uh, malady, okay? Yeah. And he was quite prominent, uh, very knowledgeable, with a, a leading Ivy League university heading the department. But he went on a show for, for a, a guy who's got this TV show who is – pretty well known in in medical in terms of like nutrition and health and you know lay medicine if you will he went on his tv show with this guy and the guy was fascinated by it and he he started doing more and more shows on that topic on that malady with other experts now this tv personality has become uh, you know he's like in the number th number 2 and 3 slot for that malady in Google. He's become an authority on the subject because he's interviewed all these people. And he's outranking these doctors who he has interviewed. Ah, uh, actually it's the problem. website, not him personally, it's the website has gotten authority and trust because of the people that are speaking. Well, the, the program, yeah. Yeah, that, not the guy personally. So right, his, but, his presentation of all these experts has have made his source. It's become made him become experts. an authority. Yeah. No, it made the website become well, an authority. To to the fact that, you know, the, the, I mean, for Christ's sake. Well, he, I see. I, I understand. Now. You're saying people will see him as an authority when he's really exactly. not. Okay. And, and the real authorities are left back on page three now. You know, I mean, that doesn't make sense. As the authority, because he's got all these authoritative figures who show uh, talk there. So See, he ranks not because of him, but because of the people on the website. Right. And but that's it. But in the old days, Doc, pre, pre eat. Uh, that website wouldn't have ranked for that reason exactly. because they. So, what does that tell you? That the new system is probably better. I don't necessarily agree with that because I don't think that he should become the de facto authority. To but they're the not ranking him, they're ranking the website. I don't care if they're ranking his fucking pet squirrel. Okay. To, to the common consumer, he has become more of an authority on this topic than this doctor who has three PhDs and has been doing it for 27 years. That to me makes no, no sense. To me, that is a step backward, Google. But you understand that the reason they're ranking him is because of the website. I understand, but I don't agree with it. It, does, it, it should not be that way. Because if you're really gonna look at authority and, and credentials, then the fact that I've had dinner at your house three times this week does not put my credibility on your shoulders. It just means you're not too picky about who you have over for dinner, okay? <laughs> but I mean, you know, it, it doesn't, it should not convey authority I, like that. But it's important that they rank that website so people see the people he's talking to. 
well, and get that information. That's still important. I agree that it it probably puts the guy in uh, a better position than he he deserves. But the website, someone knows what they're doing. I because that think, that should be your goal as a webmaster. Yeah, right? as, uh, as a webmaster, yeah. But but from a medical standpoint, in this particular situation, this guy has some really good guests on and he has some real quacks on okay and uh, basically you know if if one of his quack theories now influences somebody who would have been better off listening to a true expert to me that's detrimental yeah but i'm thinking those pages that weren't true experts one thing i noticed when i looked at this closely doc that it's a page level thing it would not have oh. the 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 PR of the whole site, right? Or the the th the authority of the whole website is not going to rank those poor pages. Well, hopefully not. Yeah. No, it's, not, it's, I, not, it's not. From it's what not. I saw, it didn't. It could make the difference because those things are done at the page level. Yeah, I agree. Not at the site level. That's correct, right, Bill? You'd agree with that? I think I'd agree with that. Yeah. Okay. There, you agree with me on something. That's a first. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Scary. But I, I think it's a mistake to think that eat isn't a, a factor. Oh, absolutely. I've seen it. Uh, I've, you know, the thing is with most of them out there, they think it's still the 1990s and you can actually say this this is making this site rank. You can't do that anymore. Anybody who thinks they can do that yeah. is, they're fooling only one person. I'm, See, the I'm good old reminded though of all the questions we used to get back when I used to be a moderator or administrator at creative site forums. And people would come to the site and say, my site suffered from the such and such update. Can you help me? What should I do? It's like audit your site, find the things that are wrong, and fix them. There are plenty of things wrong that are causing it not to rank for stuff. I just called it myself, and I've seen them. You should do that. It's it's not the update. It's it's you. Know, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Google's just not into you that much. <laughs> <laughs> Well, people take it kind of personal. Well, well the I other think. thing that I that I have a real problem with, I see people when they're talking about eat as though it is a standalone thing. It is the the big thing that you know. If, if you fix the eat, you're then you're going to be in good shape. That's going to fix everything. And uh, you know that we see that so often with you know every time something comes along, it's like you know we saw it with mobile first or, or or you know mobile responsiveness. If as long as you're mobile responsive, you're you're golden. As long as you're, you're using schema, you're golden. As long as you're addressing your eat, you're golden. I'm sorry, it don't work that way. The good old days of being able to isolate causes and, you know, problems and good stuff are gone. It's just, it's just too liquid. There's too much stuff going on. It's like trying to, to, to pick a keyword. You're ranking for a keyword. Yeah. From you on your computer at this time of day, from this place, you rank for it. Yeah. Come back in 20 minutes or have your cousin in Peoria run it and see how, you know, and, and people still are chasing rankings like it means something. Now, you know, they're not meaningless, but they're not what they were 10 years ago. They're not the, the thing you can hang your hat on anymore. And the same with eat. Yeah, you need to address it, but it's just one of many things you need to address. And I always beat my drum on the technical side. You know, the first thing you got to do is before you worry about what Google thinks of your content, what do you say we fix your site so that Google can see it? Let's make it crawlable, you know? Yeah. Take care of the technical problems that are keeping you from getting crawled and indexed. Take care of the technical problems that are chasing visitors off the minute they hit your, your homepage. Take care of the things that make your navigation impossible. They can't find what they're looking for when they get there. Then worry about the quality of your content. Well, ideally, at the same time, but I mean, don't expect your eat to fix everything for you if your site's not crawlable. You know, if if you're chasing people off, if you have no 
no uh, conversion built into your sites, whatever, whatever your goals are, stop trying to isolate one thing and thinking that's going to fix it all. It doesn't happen that way anymore. It used to many, many years ago. And that drives me nuts. If you Especially when I see somebody has got 25,000 members in their Facebook group that, that has set themselves up as some sort of a guru and, and is spouting this crap. And people are lapping it up. Off my soapbox. <laughs> For a minute. Shake your head, Bill. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm just yeah, talk about it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking of what you were talking about. The people who uh, proclaim themselves SEO experts who mm -hmm. write crap, and it's nonsense. It's like you can optimize a web page for rank brain. Just stuff it full of synonyms. It's like, yeah, guess what? It's still keyword stuffing. Oh, I'll get off my lawn. <laughs> So what else is going on this week? Any good patents you see this week? I just found one this morning that uh, I like a lot. Actually, I found two that I liked a lot. This one was uh, query rewriting using session information, which says they might look at when somebody performs a search, they might look at the queries that the person performed immediately before it and see what words they used. And they might decide that they liked some of those earlier queries and they might rewrite the query that they just performed. I, you know, I just saw that. Uh, I, I, I didn't, it didn't really sink in on me. I have seen what looked like evidence of that a few times in the past, but I was doing some research uh, today, just just about the time you pinged me. Yeah. And and I did a search. I didn't see anything on the front page that looked like it was even vaguely what I was after. So I went and reworded my query. And of course, you get the drop downs, you know, the suggestions. And and I and I saw some. I, I saw something there that looked appropriate. And I clicked on that one, and it took me where I wanted to be. And I closed the tab and then I realized, shit, I didn't, I didn't, I want to grab that quote. So I was trying to remember what the query was I put in again and it remembered it for me and it reworded it. Really? They reworded the query that I had put in, it reworded it to be more closely aligned with what I had actually ended up clicking on, which is not really unique. So it didn't really register on me, but yeah, I have seen some evidence of that, that it's looking at the previous query when you go to re reword your, your search. Yeah. I've seen, seen that. I've seen that for a while. That's nothing, you know, terribly new. I've seen my previous searches put in one letter and it start dropping yep. down yep. Uh, queries that I made recently. Uh, I like that feature because I'm it often going back. Often very handy, yeah. Easier than going back through 42 pages of history, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Also, I like, uh, I see on listings, you've been here five times before, last yeah. time was this date. That, that tells me that that was something I was using as a reference. Then I go back to it. It's something that came out with the patent on about five years ago. Yeah, it's a good feature. Search <laughs> annotations. Yeah, that's What's it called. Search result annotations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I every morning when hockey season is on, I go and check the the scores <laughs> and everything. Uh, All uh, I have to do is put N in, and it drops right down to the right <laughs> one. Just one things. letter, and you're in there. Huh? You previously yeah. came to this page before using this query term, this search term. Yeah. So, uh, not just how many times you've been to the site before, or when yeah. the last time you were there, 
but sometimes even what query terms you found inside for. Is it also uh, kind of recent where they tell you this term was missing from the results we've, this word is not in the results? I see that on individual results. In uh, it's, the it's part of the uh, original uh, query search, search term annotation or query search annotation. Oh, okay. So it was part of the original annotation yeah. stuff. Going back five years or so, yeah. That's about the same time, isn't it, that they came out with, uh, you know, you put in a query and, and it would come out and say, showing instead results for, or did you mean? That's about the same time they started that, isn't it? That's, that's been around longer because that goes with uh, when you, when they think you've possibly misspelled something. Yeah. Yeah. They'll say, did you mean? And they refer to that as a prompt. Yeah, when they first implemented that, it was first spelling. Uh, yeah, that's been a while, yeah. Yeah. Because I used to check my spelling that way. <laughs> I've been able to do that. <laughs> and sometimes uh, people who start businesses misspell the business on purpose, like Flickr. Mm -hmm. you know, with KR at the end. It's, did you mean the word flicker? You know, at some point, the name of your business that's misspelling, they'll recognize as an actual thing, an entity. Right. But Probably quicker now than they did a few years ago, too. They've been doing the entity stuff for a few years now. So we're probably. Not, Run six years of it, yeah. Because yeah, I always believed that when we they finally did say this is entities, yeah. I remembered how uh, Mr. Wall used to go on and on about Google being brand centric. He he must have felt kind of uh, embarrassed afterwards. I was on the right trail, just didn't know. <laughs> And there are things that, uh, brand is an entity, yeah. But all the things that make a brand a brand aren't necessarily the things that Google's looking for in an entity. So, so you get a brand by having, creating a certain mindset, by doing business a certain way, by having a certain uh, trade dress, certain colors that are associated with your brand and so on. And those aren't necessarily things that Google cares much about. Right. Well, it's like so I, one of the best arguments I've heard against uh, them being brand centric was somebody I saw in a thread saying, you know, the, the guy was arguing with somebody who was saying how biased they are towards brands. And he says, okay, would you say that Sears is a brand? He says, yeah, okay. Would you think that Sears can rank for washing machine or hand wrench or any name three or four different things that you can, that are famously available at Sears, yeah. but not under the Sears name. Yeah. Like like craftsman tools, Kenmore washers, this sort of thing, you know, yeah. says they, they have no association with the brand Sears yeah. as far as search is concerned. And that was the best argument I had heard against it. You know, very valid. You know, you can buy a lot of good stuff at Sears. Well, you could <laughs> at Sears, but <laughs> but uh, none of it said Sears on the packaging. Right, because they uh, built product brand lines. So you had you had a brand and a sub brand, you know, basically. But there was no connection between the two, really, mm -hmm. as far as search is concerned. So you can buy a TV at Sears, but you can't buy a Sears TV at Sears. Exactly. Yeah. You could buy some products that were manufactured by Sears. Oh, a lot of them were manufactured by Sears, but they didn't carry the Sears name. Right. They always had a different brand name, a sub-brand, if you will. Right. Most of their products were actually, uh, I don't know if you call them a joint venture or, or a, a partnership, but like Kenmore, for instance, started out as they were just distributing it and then they wanted to buy it outright and they bought a portion of it and they decided things worked better when 
it was owned outright by someone else. They sold it back off again. It seemed to me that they were doing that so that they could sell product lines off. We want to need some money. We're we're having troubles. We can solve the question. <coughs> Could be. I I was dumbfounded when that when I, you know, first started reading about them having financial difficulty because they had some killer brands leading their markets. You know, I just I just assumed that they must be doing pretty well. I guess I should have been assuming they were pissing money away like Grant took Richmond because <laughs> how in the world they ever managed to go broke, I can't imagine. All over the world. Um, Financial engineering. All all leading their markets. The Canadian stores stayed open the longest. Did they? Yeah. They were, every little town here still had a Sears place where you could go see the catalog and order stuff. And pick up your stuff. Hmm. Remember, we we don't have the big cities like we do in yeah. the United States, like where I'm from. It's fairly large now. It's part of London, Ontario. Grew right into the city I was from, which was about maybe 10, <coughs> 15 miles away. So you remember, they, you remember getting the Sears catalog in the mail? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thicker than the phone book. <laughs> And everything was in there. Yeah, my mom used to get that. And a Sears Roebuck, she would wear that thing out. All my school clothes came from Sears and Roebuck. You think it was a mistake for them to stop sending the catalog in the, in the day online? Would have been killed by the internet eventually. I, I think it might have been a bit premature. I think they might have been able to make it last a little bit longer, but they. But I, yeah, I think it was inevitable. You know, the internet, like Terry said, the internet was going to wipe them out anyway. Look at what Amazon's done to the retailing world in general. You know, you can attribute it to a lot of things, but Amazon is a big part of it. Yeah. And Amazon is another one of those love-hate things for a lot of people. Saw well, somebody yesterday come in about they, they bought something and it wasn't a, a three dollar item. They bought something, it was I'm gonna guess forty, fifty bucks, and it was the wrong size or color or something. And they contacted Amazon and they said, Okay, we'll we'll, we'll refund your account. Don't bother, send it back. And a couple of either popped into the, a couple other folks popped into the thread and said, Yeah, I bought this and same thing, you know, came in and, and it was the wrong color or or size, and they said, "Okay, don't worry about it. Just you know, give it to somebody that can use it. We'll refund your account." That's you know, on the on the customer service side. Now, for the account holder side, <laughs> if you're selling there, you know, bend over, buddy. <laughs> yep. Because <laughs> yep. they're going to bust it off in your butt. You know, yep. if the first time somebody decides to get a hair up their butt and complain that they didn't like your attitude, or they didn't like your product, or they found it cheaper someplace else, Amazon's going to make you eat it. Not only that, there's search, like the charges from Amazon alone are make it an unprofitable business. Uh, I looked at it when I was looking to retire. I wanted to keep doing something, and uh, I looked at becoming uh, like selling on Amazon. And as soon as I started seeing all the charges, yeah. For this, that, and the other thing, I said, uh-uh, this is a sucker's bet if I ever saw one. Uh, and I'm sure there's a whole lot of folks that went ahead and took that leap that would agree with you 100%. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had thought about it one time, too, and I said, no, I don't. You hear about that 1% or 2% that make a good living at it? You don't hear about the 98% that go bust. Well, I know one guy that, that uh, he was bringing a bunch of products in from uh, Asia and moving an awful lot of products. I mean, he's, I think he said his gross sales were like 100, 130 to 170,000 a month. You know, I have no idea how much of that was profit, but I mean, he was moving an awful lot of stuff. And one day somebody filed a complaint and froze his account. And he went back and forth with them for like three months. 
it's, it's Google. I mean, as Amazon has evolved into a marketplace. Very, very authoritative. And it just, you know, just, yeah. So they weren't always a marketplace. They used to just sell everything on their own. And they it's started gonna, with books. Become, they yeah. bought toys. Right. Worldwide, probably. And Yeah, I, I worked at uh, one of the Amazon fulfillment centers like a number of years ago. Uh, I remember people saying Amazon is a loser's bet. They aren't making any money. They've never turned a profit. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right they, Look they, at where Amazon makes their money. They don't really make it off the store. They well, make that, it off of AWS, at that point, the web were, services. Yeah, at that point, they were buying things. When they when they were making money off books, they were buying toy stores. When they were making money off toy stores and books, they were buying pet stores. Yeah. It just expanded and expanded and kept on expanding. Now they're in motion pictures and all kinds of stuff. And drug sales? Mm -hmm. The legal type, right? <laughs> one, one hopes. Yeah. Although, <laughs> I'll listen to anybody's arguments. <laughs> Nothing would surprise me. They bought Whole Foods as well, right? Right. And now they're doing delivery of food? They're doing some delivery of food. Uh, Groceries, they're doing some delivery of food from restaurants too. They're competing with like the uh, Uber Eats and Grubhub and so on. They're, there they're, must be, there must be 10 of those apps in Toronto. At least five of them are advertising on the TV. But eventually a, someone big like Amazon will win that bid as well. But AWS is a huge business. Yeah. Like, people don't yeah, understand how big it is. Oh, that's a, that's a big moneymaker for them there. That is their moneymaker. I, I would not be surprised to see that Amazon, the store, and all the other stuff doesn't make any money, and all the money is made on AWS. That would not surprise me. AW, it's part of the infrastructure that enables the rest of Amazon to work. And they said, let's make a profit from this too. And they yeah, said, but you, now they're bigger than Microsoft yeah. in that game. They're the biggest. Yeah. Uh, I, I would expect that they're probably not in the red on the store, but it certainly isn't the kind of profit center that AWS is. No, that the digital side is that's that's a money machine there. Also, AWS, you know, when you hear on a baseball game, the yeah. velocity of the hit, how 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 hard a ball was hit, those stats come from who? AWS. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm expecting didn't didn't FedEx ever fallen out with Amazon? Like in the last year, FedEx. Who's that? FedEx. Well, probably because they're eventually going to put them out of business too. That's what I'm thinking, yeah, I, I think at some point Amazon's going to start offering uh, shipping to the public. Like well, FedEx. they already do in a lot of ways. Do they? Yeah. Why do you think all their distribution centers? Eventually, they'll have a distribution center in every major city. That would not surprise me. Then they don't have to use FedEx, do they? Everything is local already. Well, they don't. But the public, when a consumer wants to send a package to somebody. they All that stuff in 10 years will be automated. And that's where, a, where Amazon is going with the drones and automated vehicles. Right, yeah. uh, they see FedEx as that's why they're not worried about shipping right now because they know in the end shipping's not going to be a big part of their equation. 
And I did read a story last week that the United States Postal Service is using automated trucks to deliver mail now. Uh, on some routes, yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think autonomous cars are going to move forward a lot faster than people think. Yeah, there are some uh, tractor trailer rigs out there now. They have a driver in the in the tractor, but they're totally, you know, they're totally automated. And the guy's just there as a safety factor. And they're driving, I forget where it was, but one of them was uh, going into Louisville, Kentucky, which is a major national yeah, hub. Uh, yeah. that, is, that is really probably the hub of, of the country. That's FedEx's hub, isn't it? I don't know. It could be. But, I mean, as far as trucking, uh, you know, probably 70% of the volume trucking in the United States goes through or into Louisville. Either goes into or comes out of Louisville. You know, you can't, you can't hardly do a coast-to-coast -coast run without hitting Louisville unless you're in, an in-house trucker. But uh, anyway, they, yeah, they've, got, they've got very limited, but they've got, I think it was 60-some trucks now that were running automated trucks on those routes for testing and evaluation. I think where they're going to run into problems is some of the states are going to they're going to be concerned about the safety factors or whatever, and they're going to they're going to make it difficult in some states. Yeah, but it's going to happen eventually. Uh, uh, I I see it happening because of and the I, costs. And you know, one thing that I think is is a real short term possibility, like for for Amazon, for instance, to break into the FedEx pocketbook, just documents. You know, it's it's a little bit more difficult for them to say, okay, we we can deliver this 13 pound package or this three pound package, but just to be able to say, here's a carrier, and if this thing is fully loaded, it's the equivalent of a ream of paper, you know, 2.2 pounds, one kilo, and this is the, heat, the the drone that can handle those. And if you want to send this package, here's the standard size carrier, like they already have at FedEx, for instance, yeah. standard size package. Put your papers in there. And we'll deliver it, you know, four hour. There were a bunch of lawsuits under the Commerce Clause involving tra uh, trains that stopped states from regulating the number of cars that could be on a train. Uh, because sometimes you'd have uh, a train carrying goods from one state to another, and they'd have to stop and decouple a couple the uh, uh, cars. Break them right. into sections, yeah. Yeah. And the Commerce Clause was used to uh, stop that, to develop more standards for that. And then they happened with some of the uh, shipment that an Amazon or USPS does. I, I don't think it's just that. I think trucking in general will all be autonomous. Eventually. Time. Yeah, in all probability, eventually. I think a lot of that, Bill, with, with the, the trains, the yeah. state's motivation in trying to break those down was the fact that, you, especially at a rural crossing, but even, even or I should say, especially at a, uh, at a uh, city crossing, sitting there for 45 minutes watching 180 cars go by was pretty disruptive to local traffic. Yeah. Yeah, because, and I've watched 180, 190 cars on, one train, you know, and it's, it's, it's a pisser, you know, <laughs> but uh, I think that was probably the main motivation from the state standpoint. Plus the fact that, if, you know, if, if you've got to have a yard to decouple and, and break this thing into two or even three trains, that's a job creator. That's a, a revenue creator because again, the, the state and the counties, they, they charge for the use of that section of rail by the, by the train and by the number of cars and by the tonnage, okay? Well, there's a lot of competing forces that cause standards to be created, like uh, cargo containers had to be a certain size to ideally fit on uh, trucks and cars, on, on railroad cars, and on ships. Mm -hmm. So They also just changed a lot of cars in the last few years changing the brakes and the government in Canada and the United States <coughs> said by this date, all 
cars had to have these types of brakes or something. Yeah. So a lot of new cars were built as a result and old ones just decommissioned. Yeah, so, you know, those those bodies, those uh, different organizations don't always communicate well and they need to be forced to um, meet certain standards by certain dates. Uh, they won't do it on their own, that's why. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't care. Like, it's unbelievable, uh, you know, in well, Canada, oil, seeing a whole train of oil cars is nothing. It, it, you know, yep. you see it all the time, especially if you're in the prairies. Uh, that's dangerous. Oh, yeah. one, there, one blew up here and like almost done in a whole city. So I had been reading that uh, drone cargo delivery maybe will take hold in faster in places like California than other states. And it may be a state-by-state -state experiment. And then maybe they have to develop standards to uh, uh, handle interstate commerce. Well, you know, the other thing, I think an immediate issue that has to be handled, whether it be on a state or a federal basis, is traffic control. Yeah. You know, how do you, how do you handle... If, if if there's three drones in the air over San Diego, the likelihood of them bumping into each other is pretty slim. And if you keep them at a 300 to 1200 foot altitude and two miles away from any airport, okay, you're probably not going to put it in at any risk to any aircraft. But if somebody, you know, if there's 2,500 companies in town and all of them are running a half a dozen drones delivering shit, and they're all in that 300 to 1200 altitude crisscrossing each other, pretty soon somebody's car is going to get hit with a 15 pound package from 1200 feet. <laughs> There's going to be problems. And, and I don't think anybody is yet, at least not openly talking about the kind of regulation something like that would require. You get people flying those really tiny aircraft, like ultralights. Yeah. And they're not being regulated by air traffic control. They're exempt, yeah. Yeah, if, if the thing weighs 600 pounds, at least in California, I don't know everywhere else, but if the thing weighs 600 pounds total with, a, with its passenger, it's totally exempt from any kind of requirements other than staying away from an air traffic pattern. That's all, that's the only requirement. And that's, that's the same with me if I go out to fly my kite. I got to stay the same distance away from the airport they do, you know? So... <laughs> Somebody, you know, I think you know the direction that we're going. It only makes sense that transport is going to become more automated, probably fully automated at some point. But so it's going to take a lot, a lot more regulation than what anybody seems to be thinking about right now. If you have a drone that's remote controlled, you need to register. Uh, there are. There are some municipalities in California. I don't know if there's any counties, and I haven't seen anything on a state level, but there are some, some cities in California now that are requiring you to get a city license. And they're- ah, That's a money maker. <laughs> well, I, 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 that's a motivation. City, a city will license anything they can. <laughs> it is presumably safety uh, driven yeah. because they had some issues. But who knows? But it you know? doesn't hurt that they're getting money for the I'm sure it's not hurting their feelings. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, there, there are some requirements in some areas. Now, like, for instance, here in Mexico, I can, I can take a drone up to 16, I think it's 16 and a half inch total width diameter, and I don't have to have any kind of permit or anything, okay? But if it's over that size, I actually have to get a permit to put it in the air. I don't have to have a license as an operator. I just have to have a permit for that thing to be in the air because it's big enough that presumably it could do some harm. But, uh, and the thing is now, you know, yeah, I, you can go pay $1,200 for, for about a 10 inch drone that'll go to almost 2,500 feet. Yeah. Or for $300, you can get a little six inch drone that'll go to 6,000 feet. Do the math. <laughs> you know, and they'll carry the same GoPro. <laughs> so, you know, why, 
it, it's there's going to be an awful lot of innovation around. A lot of it's going to, I think, end up being in transport, and, and it's going to both be more efficient and create a lot of job vacancy. It's going to it's going to hurt the job market a lot. So I was curious. I looked up all the patents that had come out of my town when I lived in Virginia to see if there were any inventors in town. And I, I found one patent by a guy who had uh, patented a flying motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> Too much time on his hands. <laughs> Definitely. So, I, uh, he had uh, moved out of town. At least he wasn't living there anymore. As far as I knew, but I was I was looking out when I when I walk out of my house up in the skies to make sure there weren't any motorcycles flying around. <laughs> <laughs> Not the kind of thing you would normally expect to have to duck, eh? Yeah, but having found that there was somebody who invented one in my town it was enough to make it a possibility. Well, I, I may be showing my old fuddy-duddy bone, but uh, it was many years ago when I started worrying about the impact to our society uh, broad, broadly uh, in the event of an EMP, okay, electromagnetic pulse, yeah. that basically cooks any and all electronics in range. And now we're getting to the point where we're so dependent upon electronics, you know, our cars, the pumps that that will refill them, our power distribution grid, our, our homes themselves, our communication network, everything is electronics, you know. What would be more devastating than a, you know, 50 kiloton EMP over San Diego County? It would basically turn the, the majority of Southern California into a graveyard. And that's that's kind of concerning. I I love progress. It's fascinating. I like watching it. I to a certain degree, I enjoy benefiting from it. But yeah. it's concerning too. Don't give them any ideas. <laughs> oh, I doubt very seriously that I'd be the first to have thought of it. We're we're still a few years away from the Internet of Things taking full hold and having electronic uh, bicycles and things like that. But it's coming. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah so, but some of the stuff they think is going to happen, I don't think so. N not as with people my age, anyhow. You'll never see me checking the refrigerator to see what I need. Yeah, how much milk uh, have I got, fridge? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know that. I don't need the fridge to tell me what I got and don't if, got. If I need Same that, I probably <laughs> shouldn't be allowed to pick my own groceries. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, I just. Some of the stuff is so over the top, it's, it's ridiculous. I had to replace my oven about a month ago because it wouldn't stop beeping. Because the sensor was saying that uh, something was wrong with one of the thermostats in it. And the sensor was obsolete. It, was, it needed replacing because the sensor was bad. And the sensor was uh, no longer available. A two dollar sensor. <laughs> so what? You had to continue listening to the alarm. I had to listen. I was able to turn it off, but I couldn't use the oven. Oh wow! So, so that, for a two dollar piece, you had to scrap the oven. Uh, so, well, you know, I, I went out and bought a lock set here a couple of months ago to put on my outside tool room. Yeah. And it was, a, I think, quick set or slag. Yeah, I mean, it was a decent, it was a known brand. It wasn't top of the line, but it was a known brand. And uh, I picked it up at the at the swap meet. It didn't have any keys. I thought, no problem. I'll just take it down to my buddy here, the locksmith. He can make a key for me in New York minute. Well, yeah. used to be at the cylinders, you could take them apart and change the pins and springs and, and create a key. Can. Now they're, they're pressed together. You ain't taking it apart. So I said, okay. So I had my daughter stop at Home Depot and pick me up a new one that comes with keys. And I opened it up. And, it's, and, and this is a slag, okay? A $45 doorknob. Yeah. 
and it's the same way. It's pressed together. You can't open them up anymore. It's like trying to work on a car. If you don't have a computer programming degree, don't try to do a goddamn oil change. <laughs> <laughs> can't even change the oil. Oh, I mean, trying to... Oh, it's just, it's, I think it's, it's getting ridiculous. I understand the innovative spirit. You know, guys want to try to develop something new, they come up with a new idea, and some of those weird new ideas actually get taken and turned into something really good by somebody else. So have you ever owned a car with a carburetor built into it? A car with a carburetor built into carburetor. it? Carburetor. Built into it, no? Yeah. No. Like a little carburetor you pull... Yeah, I always bolt mine on top of the intake manifold. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, I had a I had to replace a power drive on my car now, which does what a carburetor used to do, except it costs like twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> it was it was like four hundred, but it it cost twelve hundred to install and program. Yeah, which is why they did it. You can't like now. You have to take your car to the dealership to get it fixed. You can't, or not too many shops are really a, even equipped to fix a new car. Well, I, I, I had to bring two keys into the dealer uh, for them to use a program the car with. The, the new uh, drive computer, which, which regulates how much air gets sucked into the gasoline, like the carburetor used to do. I saw uh, just a few days ago on the news that uh, I don't remember what state it was, but some state had a bill uh, that had passed one house of their Congress and was expected to pass again to make it illegal for you to work on your car. If you were not a certified mechanic on that particular make and model, it would be illegal for you to work. So if you pop the hood, you better just be checking the water level. Because if you plan on doing a tune-up or, or changing the oil or anything like that, it's against the law. And I thought, Jesus. Really? You know, we've become so dependent on garbage. But more and more, Doc, people don't, like, people now don't want to do that kind of stuff. I, Nobody wants to work on their own car much anymore. Well, you, you almost can't if you don't have a computer science degree. You almost well, can't. Well, yeah, that's what <laughs> – but – I mean, even if they could, they would. They'd rather, you know, dirty hands and all. And, and how long before they say you have to be a licensed gardener before you're allowed to cut the grass? You know. Well, that's. I mean, pretty soon you're going to have to be a licensed horticulturist to be allowed to cut your lawn. No, I don't think so. You know, it's just it's getting ridiculous. Well, of course, and, I, and but people, that's what government. It's been do. ridiculous to some degree for a long time, but it's getting worse all the time. And I think, you know, I just see people just kicking back, say, "Well, that, yeah, that's stupid. Yeah, it doesn't affect me, so I don't like cutting the grass anyway." Right? <laughs> I don't like working on my car anyway, so you know. So, yeah. I mean, I understand stuff like not letting uh, Joe Schmuck replace the power panel in his house, you know rerun gas lines from the street into his home. I understand that you know, there's a fence there. Let's not level the neighborhood, you know, but, but, uh, boy, there's a lot of soapboxes around this place today. That was a quick hour today, man. It was. Oh, you, you said there was two patents you saw, that you saw come out you really liked. You didn't mention the second one yet. What was it? I mentioned one of them. The other one was uh, called Providing Search Results Using Augmented Search Queries, which I haven't gotten into much more than that. I, I just found that one. It... It's something to do with entities. I I need to dig into it more. Hmm. Augmented. What does that mean? There was a, another patent which said uh, 
those about augmented queries. I thought they might be the same one. I made sure they weren't. The augmented queries one said, they might look at the structured data on website and also the query logs for a website uh, and find other terms that might be appropriate for that website and compare uh, the results of those terms in search results with the results of terms on the website itself. And if the query, uh, the augmented query terms did as well or better than the terms from the website, they might show both the augmented query results and the query results for the terms on the website together. They might mix them up in the search results. Mm -hmm. So this way you could rank for things that might be like in the schema on your website because they might use terms from schema. Interesting. So it's a different way of using the term augmented, but I'm thinking it's probably related. The inventors are different. They're not the same people. I checked that too. But I haven't actually started to break that down into uh, what it actually means. So what they would use that when there wasn't as many results as they thought was good, or they would they would uh, try to get a sense of what people might want to see. You know, when when they when they uh, rewrite queries using synonyms they're saying okay what what are, what are, what do people actually want to find oh, okay no I, I okay is this site going to satisfy their uh search intent their interests and of course that that could uh you know whatever click through they find on that and feedback they could get some pretty interesting feedback to their machine learning algos yeah So, you know, if, if you have a website about lawyers and people keep on searching for attorneys, your website's going to make them happy anyway. But you're just using the wrong words on your website. In that case, I can tell you almost. Yeah. Uh, the, those two words are almost interchangeable with Google now. Yeah. You might see a few more results. Uh, but from one from the other, but you'll see lots of the same results in both queries. Not exactly the same, but very close to the same. It's like an automobile and a car, almost exactly the same thing, unless you're talking about a railroad car, in which case it right. has nothing to do with an automobile. But usually that have a modifier around the word car as well. Yeah. An attorney is a lawyer is an attorney, unless it's a uh, dep uh, attorney general, in which case it has nothing to do with law. No, or a power of, yeah. Yeah. The ultimate lawyer. <laughs> the guy with the final say. <laughs> yeah. And that's the guy you're going to hire to... Uh, do your divorce or get your ticket fixed. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wouldn't hire our present attorney general to sweep my patio. <laughs> <laughs> so this let us record much longer than 40 minutes. I guess they upgraded you again. I saw that. Yeah. Partway through, there's a quick message that said we were upgraded for, and we could have it as long as we wanted. Oh, okay, I missed that message. <laughs> it just flashed, but for a second. Two weeks in a row. They're, they're really trying to upsell you, buddy. I think so. Yeah.
And <coughs> seems to be working well. I think that's going to be it for a short day, though. Yep. We've had two shows in a row where we did talk mostly about search. <laughs> I know. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop. Thank you for joining us. Hey. Take care. Bye now. Later, everybody. You got your whiskey, Doc. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, finally, I just started up my X split to see. This this thing here, I went out. I I went ahead and ordered.